morning class and welcome to our lecture on Brian Doyle's Joyous Voladores. So Brian Doyle is a Canadian author, uh, still alive in his mid 80s, and he has written uh, children's books. Um, some have been even adapted to the screen, I believe. So he is a well known writer <clears throat> in the Canadian context. Um, and uh, aside from fiction, um, he has authored uh, some really wonderful works like this uh, lyrical essay called Joyous Valadores. And um, what I'd like us to do is to think about the uh, ability to develop context in the um, part two of your assignment in relation to what you observe in Doyle's text. So I want you to learn actively from reading Doyle's text and to uh, follow some uh, methodologies or strategies for uh, sentence variation, but also for the establishment of a particular theme or just an idea that you really want to bring into your own assignment. <clears throat> Excuse me. So here we are, and um, these will be available for you. Um, the lecture slides actually have been uh, developed with the guidance of my uh, supervisor at York University. Um, so some of this analysis is uh, Professor Mikashu's. Um, I wanted to share with you um, this uh, descriptive paragraph that begins Doyle's text uh, in a way that uh, asks you to consider sentence structure and then to consider the creative usage of some words uh, that uh, are not outside of the realm of our parole, perhaps, or the kinds of words that we speak and we understand um, in daily language. But Doyle does something really uh, clever with some of these words. So let's pay attention to sentence structures, to words, and the construction of meaning in this first, first paragraph, how it is achieved. So. Uh, the first sentence uh, of the essay begins with the imperative construction. Uh, it is a sentence where uh, you're told to do something, right? So anything from open the book to uh, close the window, these are imperatives and the subject is implied. It is the person to whom the sentence is re referring um, or uh, it is the person who is being asked to respond to the imperative construction. So Doyle begins with, consider the hummingbird for a long moment. So it's an interesting way to begin an essay. Um, it, it is perhaps uh, reminiscent of this kind of conversational style that we witnessed in Stephen King's text. So. The first sentence is fairly short. The second sentence notice is also short. A hummingbird's heart beats 10 times a second. Third sentence, again, short. A hummingbird's heart is the size of a pencil eraser. Interesting analogy, we'll talk about that as well. And then finally, a hummingbird's heart is a lot of the hummingbird. So notice the repetition of the same subject in sentences two, three, and four. And this repetition uh, achieves something um, that we can perhaps call parallelism. So a kind of construction of listing things in a way that gets the reader to see um, the subject and its relation to the uh, verb construction um, and the building of the meaning. Uh, as a result of this. So a hummingbird's heart beats 10 times a second. So you have uh, heart as the uh, ma main word of the uh, subject. And then hummingbirds uh, modifies the heart, but the heart beats 10 times a second. So beats, we have the verb in the first uh, sentence of these uh, four, uh, three listed, um, parallel sentences. A hummingbird's heart is the size of a pencil eraser. So first we're told what it does or how it does it, um, how quickly it beats. 
then we are told how small it is and it is compared uh, to a pencil eraser. So uh, you can think about this rough comparison as something that allows you to quickly picture the size of the uh, heart of a hummingbird. And finally, a hummingbird's heart is a lot of the hummingbird. So that's a different kind of sentence uh, from the first two with the heart at the center um, of the sentence um, because it tells us now something a little bit more um, figurative. It, it um, creates an image in our head of how much the heart must occupy the size of this tiny bird, right? So um, there are many uh, species of the hummingbirds you see on the screen here. You have the uh, long beaked one uh, with this beautiful coloration. So, um, but the establishment of what's significant about the hummingbird um, is already happening in the very opening of the passage, right? Um, so after these short sentences, we have a very long sentence. It begins with a fancy Latin term for the hummingbird. Um, so there's history, contextual information and historical information coded right into uh, this sentence that follows uh, the short sentences that give us some interesting facts um, about the hummingbird, which are more like the pure description. So, joyous Valadores, comma, flying jewels. So, flying jewels is what it means uh, 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 in Spanish, actually, joyous Valadores, but in, um, coming from the Latin. Um, so, uh, what does the word uh, Voladores, typo, sorry, Voladores, what does that actually um, mean? It means uh, something quick, perhaps. What other words um, does Voladores uh, remind you of? Um, so, if you think of a word in English today, you could say, oh, it sounds like volatile, right? So, there's speedy little flying jewels. And uh, so Doyle tells us that the first white explorers of the Americas called them this, joyous Valadores, and the white men had never seen such creatures. So here's a list of clauses that Doyle employs to kind of give you a historical context of these birds. For hummingbirds came into the world only in the Americas, nowhere else in the universe, more than 300 species of them. So notice how he continues building uh, clause upon clause, you get contextual information and then you, map, you get more descriptive information. So more than 300 species of them whirring and zooming and nectaring in Hummer time zones, nine times removed from ours, their hearts hammering faster uh, than we could clearly hear it if we pressed our elephantine ears to their infinitesimal chests. So, simple observation, sentence structures, four short sentences, and then you get a really long one. This is what we mean by sentence variation. Um, when we say your sentences should have variety in sentence uh, structure length, um, the emphasis of where you are uh, trying to get the reader's attention to rest in any particular sentence, right? So, for example, in this long sentence, you have Joyous Voladores, which uh, links us to the title of the piece, um, and then Flying Jewels is uh, a definition or a definitive kind of, that's what it means, in case you didn't know. Um, and then, you know, the focus actually shifts away from the flying jewels to the people who discovered them. And then the focus shifts back by using these very creative um, forms of fairly simple verbs that we know, uh, or even a noun that uh, Doyle turns into a verb. Um, we come back to the, um, the bird, right? So, joyous Valadores, then you have this kind of almost parenthetical 
why they're called and who called them that. And then you get your verbs that uh, allow you to picture their activity. So to were, to zoom, these are not particularly difficult words, but notice the parallel construction of the ing, whirring, zooming, and nectaring, coming from the word nectar, right? Um, this is how they feed from the nectar of the uh, flowers. Um, but uh, Doyle uses this um, um, atypical um, construction, nectaring, right? So if you look at this paragraph, so much is happening already. And uh, it is a descriptive paragraph, but it also offers you, as I suggested, some contextual information. So if we look at uh, a slightly deeper analysis, um, you will again want to think about where are my subjects and where are my verbs and what work are they doing? You know, there are so many other ways in which this information can be relayed in a similar way. Um, for example, instead of having these three sentences with the same subject uh, at the beginning of each, there could have been a different list of a longer sentence uh, construction where you would say something like a hummingbird's heart beats 10 times a second, comma, is the size of a pencil eraser, comma, and is a lot of the hummingbird. It wouldn't be perfectly parallel, but it would also be long and taxing on the reader's attention. So what Doyle is doing in part here is slowly read, leading the reader into the exploration of the hummingbird, followed by a long sentence, which requires a lot more attention of, of the reader. Okay. Then we have a paragraph that essentially mimics this structure. Um, so if you look at the second paragraph of Joyce Volodoris, it also begins with a kind of a list. So um, each one visits a thousand flowers a day. I'm not sure why I have so many typos here. They can dive at 60 miles an hour. They can fly backward. They can fly more than 500 miles without pausing to rest. But when they rest, they come close to death on frigid nights and so on. So you have short sentence, short sentence, short sentence, short sentence. And in this construction, they, the pronoun they, is used instead of uh, hummingbird. And, and it's not uh, quite the same as the hummingbird's heart repetition. Um, but it recalls that similar structure. So why is he doing this? How does this impact the reader on a both cognitive but also an emotional level? Is there an establishment of um, some kind of patterning in the thought of the reader that allows the reader to experience uh, the rhythm of the ideas that Doyle is delivering, right? Because again, the first sentence of this paragraph um, gives us some good descriptive information about the life of a hummingbird. You know, they are uh, definitely some of the most um, agile and uh, busy bodied kind of creatures on this planet, right? So a thousand flowers a day just to feed itself. But we are also told uh, more information about why it is perhaps that they move so much, right? So you get, you know, they can dive at 60 miles an hour. Wow. They can fly backwards. Very cool. Um, they can fly more than 500 miles without pausing to rest, um, which uh, I'm not sure how that compares to other flying creatures on this planet, but it sounds impressive to um, a human who cannot fly. Um, so all this stuff that kind of dazzles the reader and then you get, um, or dazzles and it perhaps is an overstatement, but um, certainly Doyle is working hard to impress you with uh, this information about um, the, or the description about the hummingbird. And then you get the longer sentence again, but when they rest, 
which obviously responds to the ending of the previous sentence. So they can fly so long without pausing to rest, but when they rest, they come close to death. Interesting. So on frigid nights, when they are starving, they retreat into torpor, their metabolic rate slowing to a 15th of their normal sleep rate. So their body is clearly designed to conserve energy in some ways, but it is uh, almost at a uh, dangerous cost uh, to their body. Um, although I'm not uh, savvy with a more in-depth look at the design of this um, creature's uh, biology, etc. Um, and probably neither is Doyle. He is a writer. He's not a scientist either. But there is research that went into this work of um, helping the reader <clears throat> understand something about this bird, which then Doyle takes into further significance for why it is uh, a, a worthy um, topic to consider, right? <clears throat> so we get again into this imperative. Consider for a moment those hummingbirds who did not open their eyes again today, this very day in the Americas. So on the one hand, <clears throat> you get this um, contrast between all this activity and all this life that these creatures experience and bring to this planet. If you've ever seen a hummingbird fly, they're quite a joyous um, uh, flying jewel type of creature that could put a smile on your face very easily. Um, in part because I think as Doyle is successfully demonstrating, we are in awe with the natural uh, beauty and talents of these creatures, right? So then you get to consider what it's like for one to die. And then this is followed by a long list of the different uh, names of species of this uh, creature, right? So notice the rhythm, the interesting um, uh, choice of positioning for each particular um, like why this order? Why does it start with bearded helm crests, for example, and booted racket tails, and then violet tailed sylphs and violet capped wood nymphs, crimson topazes and purple crowned fairies, red tailed comets and amethyst wood stars, rainbow bearded thornbills and glittering bellied emeralds, velvet purple coronets and golden bellied star frontlets, fiery tailed allbills and andrian sorry, Andean hill stars, spatula tails and puff legs. I've seen a picture of puff legs. They have very fuzzy um, legs, very cute. And then, so again, why didn't it, the list begin with, I mean, you know, it could have been organized alphabetically, for example. What is the logic behind this organization is an interesting question to ask. And as an author, you make these choices when you describe. But then it's followed by commentary. Um, each the most amazing thing you have never seen. The comment on how rare these creatures are, especially in the uh, time zone that Doyle is pointing to, which is uh, Canada. We have at least one type of hummingbird in Canada. I've seen it here. Um, but they're not the um, uh, multicolored type, they are uh, fairly plain in comparison to their uh, southern um, ancestors. So the final clause in this paragraph, each made heart silent, a brilliant music stilled. So this clause recalls the seizing of the heart and con the consideration that Doyle is asking you to make about a creature dying, right? So why all this? I mean, the piece could have been a more scientific look at all the different fantastical features of the hummingbird. Is there something else that Doyle is pursuing here? So let's move then into the ending of this particular text. Um, and I said 
the word lyrical at the beginning of the lecture. Um, the ending is constructed very differently if you compare it to uh, the opening passages. And I welcome you to do such a close reading of sentence structures and the use of analogies and the use of lists throughout the rest of the text to see how, for example, Doyle moves from describing a hummingbird's heart to the heart of a whale and what this contributes to the lyrical effect of this text. So the ending begins with this sentence, you, so now we're in second person and um, instead of uh, implying that the reader should consider something, uh, now it's even more direct. You, you dear reader, can brick up your heart as stout and tight and hard and cold and impregnable as you possibly can. And here's the transitioning thought and down it comes in an instant. So part of what is happening here is that all the considerations of different creatures' hearts and the ways in which a heart can function in the world, I guess you can say, the different qualities of different hearts of different creatures. Now we are talking about human, human hearts. <clears throat> so um, this is now a consideration of what we think about hearts in a more figurative way, that a heart is not just a, an organ for pumping blood, but it's uh, the place where we locate emotion. Um, again, figuratively speaking. Um, so Brian is asking us to consider how after experiencing pain and suffering in the world, after um, being hurt uh, too many times and having your heart broken, as we say, right? Again, figurative language. Um, you can become a really cold hearted person or hard hearted. This, these are expressions we use, right? So you can make your heart cold and, and hard. And he even uses this interesting idea of uh, being impenetrable, but Doyle uses impregnable. So a heart that is no longer open to, you can say perhaps new life, new possibilities of feeling, um, that this wall, again, metaphoric wall, um, that you build around your heart can come down in an instant. How? Here's a list, another list. And I ask you to consider the different elements and different images and the kind of construction of comparing what possibly could influence somebody's heart to flutter, right? So. Here's the list, felled by a woman's second glance, a child's apple breath, the shatter of glass in the road, the words, I have something to tell you, a cat with a broken spine dragging itself into the forest to die, the brush of your mother's papery ancient hand in the thicket of your hair, the memory of your father's voice early in the morning, echoing from the kitchen where he is making pancakes for his children. So we have quite a list here. And I admit I teared up when I read this text for the first time. And um, I'm not sure if it was, um, well, never mind. I was going to make a joke about some things perhaps I didn't experience, as, did not experience as a child, like ever seeing my father cook. Um, or uh, the idea of uh, poor um, injured cat, um, or you know memories of some special event in life, um, like seeing your child's first breath, or having a special moment with someone, etc. Right? But you get the point. I think that Doyle is reaching for here. And so I, I, I'm perplexed by the cat, to be honest. I think that it definitely stands out as something that does not belong to the rest of the list in the same way. It's not quite the same as the rest. Um, 
So I, I want you to think about what brings all these examples together, why in this order, once again, and how we are affected by the list's progression from some romantic interest to a childhood memory and pancakes and so on. So you too are welcome to uh, learn from these tricks of the trade, I guess you can call them, uh, of using lists of comparing ways, uh, you know, the constructions of analogies that help you to bring out a particular um, feature of whatever it is that you're describing, right? So we're trying to actively learn, as I said, from these uh, very um, talented writers, well-established writers who are consciously crafting their text. And so if you want a kind of step-by-step, -step, um, how do I craft my second part of the assignment? I would say that first, um, I want you to consider the grammatical and stylistic feedback you received on part one to say, okay, um, my instructor wants me to look at the way I use sentence fragments, for example, because they're not uh, forbidden, but sentence fragments, as I mentioned before, um, are a, a break in decorum of writing that should be used consciously. In other words, we typically do not write in fragments. We can speak in fragments quite often, but we typically do not write in fragments. We try to write sentences that are complete in their meaning and thought and grammatical structure. So if you use a fragment, there should be a good reason for that. Um, editing your own uh, first part, the description, uh, should involve this kind of sentence structure analysis. How many short sentences do I have? How many long ones? Do I vary uh, the short and long sentences, uh, I mean, that's a simplistic way of looking at it, but, you know, do I uh, construct my sentences in a way that gives the reader a break from uh, really long loaded sentences? Are all my sentences kind of short and simple? Should I have uh, a moment where the reader is asked to contemplate more things at once? Um, so the example of that here was the, uh, final sentence of the very first paragraph, right? Where you get so much information about the birds, about the people who discovered them, etc. So this should be part of your active analysis of how your own paragraphs work. Then second step would be to say, uh, once you've kind of set your heart on the approach of developing the significance of your object. So for example, in Wolf, there's a kind of overarching theme of the contrast between life and death. Um, you have environmental undertones in McPhee's piece, etc. You can write a few trial sentences which will help you to render the object significant um, to your reader. So not just to you, but you have to consider affect. You have to think how does the text I'm crafting um, create the possibility of other humans con connecting to it emotionally? And then once you draft some thoughts and write down some sentences, then this is the really difficult part. How do you start to think about incorporating those sentences into a uh, piece that gives more context and significance. So my advice would be write, 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 and then uh, edit out everything you think is not um, useful to your purpose of creating uh, an emotional resonance with your readers in response to your object. You know, so you can look at your, uh, what you've produced and say, do I need more or, or fewer sentences here? Um, is there anything, for example, you don't know about the object you're describing? Um, should you do a little bit of research and find out a little more about your object? Have you considered how to lay out the information that you know about the object and its significance? Have you considered all possible structures of your paragraphs? That's again, more on the um, sentence level analysis. So I hope that this helps you to uh, think about the second step of our assignment. And I'll share one more thing with you before we
close today's lecture. Um, and this is my own struggles with writing significance for that pen example that I've offered to you. So uh, the, um, the passage that I offered as an example um, was about a pen, yes? So if you recall, the first sentence was, a wooden pen lay in front of me on a faux wood desk of a sterile windowless office. Here's my draft of context or significance. And I'm writing in a way that's almost a conversation with myself. I wrote, how does one explain imagination? Science gives us words for the kind of mental tools humans possess, which animals are often denied. Memory, ability to recall different objects and combine them in one's mental attic are all approximations, disappointing in their inability to say how great artists are born or raised. Western obsession with the material claims that technology enhances our imagination, while Eastern perspectives point to an original software we all possess to learn and create. Our minds are the final frontier of the unknown, somebody recently wrote, and no new neurological study seems able to paint a conclusive picture of what the mind does to conjure up fresh ways of experiencing the world. So this is a draft. Not all of it will go into my own uh, descriptive uh, ephemeron. But as I write all this, I begin to think about the kind of uh, word associations, the kind of figurative language that I just produced and why, right? So for example, mental attic, um, as a, you know, reference to our, uh, whatever it is that we think our um, neurons are uh, as a bundle in our brain. Um, I comment on what concerns me in my own life, Western, um, uh, corporate capitalist obsession with material things, including technology, as opposed to Eastern perspectives on the kind of treasures that are contained already within your own psyche or soul, if you will. So I did read somebody, but I can't remember who it was, who claimed that our minds are the final fr frontier, which is a reference to a kind of science fiction world of what we don't know, right? So space, outer space, as opposed to inner psyche. Um, so this is all raw, very raw. It will not probably make it all into the final draft, but then I begin to edit what I already had. So for example, instead of having the passive construction of a wooden pay lay in front of me, um, uh, sorry, not passive voice, but uh, a, um, a perspective on, on the pen as uh, distanced. Uh, and so instead of having an active subject, uh, uh, um, the perceiver as the active subject, I have uh, the pen being the focal uh, point of the first draft. Whereas here I consider what it would be like to switch to, I pick up, so now making it first person uh, perspective on what is being described, I pick up a wooden pen in front of me. It is time to open its companion notebook that lies on a faux wood desk of my windowless office. So I add a friend to the pen. I add a notebook to my desk. And then the rest of it is the same pretty much. But uh, then I develop uh, perhaps a moment that will help me to get into the kind of reflection that I just drafted above about imagination. So as I write, I search through catalogs of word associations and string together suitable signifiers. This pen has an aura of learnedness or self-study. This is an insight, an epiphany, some may call it, although my friend has an allergy to epiphanies. They sound too fatalistic, perhaps, contrived. Yet what do we do to make sense of moments in life that seem to arrive unannounced. And then this is the part I already had about the pen and it's um, where it comes from. 
there's more. There's more I can add, and I will share more with you in our next lecture. But for now, um, as I described uh, in our lecture slides on Joyous Voladoras, I want you to think about how your object will be perceived by the readers and what you can do to shape their perception through the addition of context and significance. So this is part two, and then bringing them together will make you do further consideration and further editing. And this is what writers do. So this is a strategy for you to start building through your own readings and through your own uh, experimentation with these writing assignments in our class. So I hope that you find this helpful and I will see you soon. Take care.